And welcome to church. Make yourselves at home. Yeah? We can do that? Welcome back to Trevor Michelle. I love you guys. So happy. Yeah. There's a, there's a line in the song that we sang and called This I Believe. It says, I believe in, the holy ch- in His holy church. Is that a statement you resonate with? You believe in His holy church? Because if you do, it means you believe in what we are doing here today. The Apostle Paul would say to us that in the church, God displays his wisdom. So guess what? We are wise beyond our years because there's an eternal wisdom at present in the room this morning. It is a wisdom that has gone before us. It is a wisdom that is way behind us. And it is a wisdom that is here today in its collective form. And the Bible tells us that we are this witness to the world with this great wisdom that we hold. And this wisdom is based in something we're about to remember, celebrate, declare, whichever way you want to speak over the communion service. It's this time when the church gathers to remember what Christ has done and the wisdom that God gave to us through the suffering and dying of Christ. He not only gave us his wisdom, but in his wisdom, which is his word, he gave us his freedom. And we declare his freedom. We have declared it this morning. We should be declaring it over the lives of each of us who are here today. So if you could look left and look right and look front and look back just for a moment. And just to be able to say God has declared his freedom over that person. So let us stay free as the Apostle Paul would say. And so Christ in his freedom before he went to the cross he gathered his people together. And with a great act of love, he washed their feet and he basically said to them, this is how we make ourselves at home in the kingdom. We are together. We are one. We are washed. And we are clean through what Christ has done. We are going to give thanks to God for the bread which represents the body of our Lord and Saviour. Thank you, Lily. Father, we come together in humble thanks for the great gift that was given at the cross. Lord, I pray as we take this bread into our bodies that we use that symbol of taking all that Christ is into ourselves and pray that you bless it. In Jesus' name, amen. So, Father, it was with a heart of joy that we just embrace this place of grace that Christ has opened up to us through his suffering and his, the shedding of his blood. I thank you, Father, that we can collectively call ourselves the body of Christ, the gathered people, the church. And here, Father, you have placed your wisdom. And, Father, in here is also your love. The Bible says that the people of this world will know us as your disciples by the love that we have and show to one another. And so, Father, today in this room, we cry out and say, let love abound. Let it love abound in the relationships right in this room so far that it is seen so clearly and it becomes such a voice in a community, in a city, in a land and even a world where people so much need to hear of the loving message of Christ. And so, Father, today we commit all that we're about to do in the Word of God to you, and we ask, Father, that you'll speak to us through it. We pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, Rochelle's going to come up, and she's going to read to you from Hebrews. If you've got your Bibles, I want you to open up to Hebrews chapter 11. And we're starting from verse 1 of Hebrews chapter 11, going down to verse 6. power of bold faith. Now faith brings our hopes into reality and becomes the foundation needed to acquire the things we long for. It is all the evidence required to prove what is still unseen. This testimony of faith is what previous generations were commended for. Faith empowers us to see that the universe was created and beautifully coordinated by the power of God's words. He spoke and the invisible realm gave birth to all that is seen. 
Faith moved Abel to choose a more acceptable sacrifice to offer God than his brother Cain, and God declared him righteous because of his offering of faith. By his faith, Abel still speaks instructions to us today, even though he is long dead. Faith lifted Enoch from this life and he was taken up into heaven. He never had to experience death. He just disappeared from this world because God promoted him. For before he was translated to the heavenly realm, his life had become a pleasure to God. And without faith living within us, it would be impossible to please God. For we come to God in faith, knowing that he is real and that he rewards the faith of those who truly seek him. Okay, before we come to the word, I'm just going to spend a little bit more time in prayer. I'm going to keep praying for Stan Riley. Uh, Stan's been in hospital this week. He's on the improve. He's been moved to a hospital in Strathfield. I'm still hunting down the name on that one. Do we know, Jared, the name of the hospital he's in? We'll have it by the end of the service. And at the altar call, I'll give you the name. <laughs> but he's doing, he's doing better, a, a little better. And so just keep praying for Stan in that place. It's great to see Craig back with us, and Craig's had an awful week with sickness and illness. He's got his birthday this week, so got to be better for that. But we want to thank God. It's just so good to see Craig over there, isn't it? It doesn't even body worship. I just love it. Absolutely love it. And I'm sure, again, in your world, there's lots of things going on, and there's people there that you're just crying out to in prayer too. So I thought we'd pray. Also got this massive election that's happening in America and how good is it that it's going to be over this week? Yeah. Hope so. <laughs> I want to speak faith into this though because you hear fear every single day. Do you not? Mm-hmm. You hear slander every single day. You hear just people having a crack at each other every <laughs> single day. And any wonder people are going, where's this going to end? If that's all we're speaking over it, then I wonder if that's what we should be expecting. And so maybe today we could actually declare something greater, even over America. I know we've got a few Americans here. Married to one. Lily's here. I'm sure there's a few others. And, uh, hey, let's just ask the Lord to do what only he can do. Shall we do that? Let's pray together. Father, we believe in a God that is just so here and present and listens to our prayers, and we love you. We want to just declare that we love you, that our hearts are fully devoted to you, that we want to see your kingdom come. We want to see your will be done in, on the earth as it's been done right now in the heavens. And so, Father, in the heavens, I don't think you'd be doing fear. I don't think you'd be doing guilt and shame. I don't think you're doing condemnation gossip or slander, I think, Father, you're speaking words of love and life. And that's, Father, what we want to be as our voice from this church, that we will speak love and life. We speak it over those who are here. We speak it over those who are ill. And I think particularly of Stan this morning that, Lord, we, as a church collectively, we want to speak love and life over him. And, Father, that a healing will flow into him. And, Jesus, before long, we'll see him back here with us as the collective body on a Sunday morning. We give you thanks that Craig is is well and healthy. And Lord, I pray, Father, to continue restoration over him and strength. But it just fills my heart with joy to see him worship. It fills my heart with joy to see Giselle singing her heart out again. And I pray, Father, a blessing over her family. But Lord, now as we turn our hearts to the word of God, we desire, Father, for you to speak so that our lives transform, so that we can be a church that just does mission wherever we are and that your love will flow from us. Today, Father, we cry out to you for a nation like America, and we hear, Father, all the things in the media, but we know that you are greater. And so, Father, I pray for the the Church of America to rise up as one today and declare your greatness today over a land. And may we see today a shift spiritually that will go politically, and, Father, that we will see something of your kingdom flow from this time as well. But now, Lord, let something of your kingdom flow from this very platform. In Jesus' name, amen. Okay, Hebrews chapter 11, much preached and much heard. um, And it's the next part of where I'm preaching from in Hebrews. Now, I've had a little bit of a change of shifting of preaching in in this month. As advertised, uh, is not actually going to be as it's happening, happening. Next week, Michael will be preaching to us. But the week after, I've been fortunate, or I think we've been fortunate enough to get a guy from Bethel 
who's going to be preaching here on the 20th of November. Now, if you remember Melissa Amato, she came to a cafe church and it was just such a great night. I am believing for the Sunday, the 20th of November, to be such a great morning in the spirit as well. Uh, so if you want to come along, he has a message of transformation and change as well. And I'm sure you'll be blessed by it. So that's November the 20th. Then the week after is my dad. My earthly dad. He will be speaking for my heavenly dad. Is that cool? Yep. That's really cool. So it's going to be a good month from the front of the church. And so come along and, and engage and be blessed. This morning I want to talk to you about how faith speaks. And I believe that faith has a language of its own. You know, years ago I started reading Tolkien. And I, I enjoy reading Tolkien. Uh, and I read Lord of the Rings, as you guys know. And I, I kind of love it. And I'm going to Lord of the Rings country this month. And I'm going to enjoy that too. And hang out with the hobbits and the elves and Gandalf. Anyway, you know the trivia that goes around Lord of the Rings and, and Trish is my almanac on trivia of, of anything Tolkien. Uh, Tolkien created his own language for the elves. He created a language. Has anyone ever thought about creating a language before? You just thought you'd sit down, oh, Lisa has. So Lisa's gonna be preaching to us in January so maybe she can share some more of that place. But imagine creating your own language. Just making words up that mean something. And you can't just have half a dozen words. You can't even just have a hundred words. You've got to have thousands of words. And then you've got to make sentence structures out of them. And, and it's got to sound good too. You hear those elves talk? It's just like butter, isn't it? It's just they talk. You have no idea what they're saying, but it sounds really, really nice. But he created his own language. And my brain goes, I wonder how long it would take us to create a language. It wouldn't be overnight. But sometimes when you get frustrated with your kids when they're young and the words come out of your mouth that, that don't even make sense, you try to combine names. I call Jake and Zach Jack. If I say Jack, I get both of them. Make sense? I'm just making stuff up, right? Creates not his own language. And then I started thinking about the scripture, in particular in Hebrews chapter 11, and I believe faith has its own language. I believe faith speaks. And I believe faith is unique in its language and unique in its speech, unique in its understanding, and it leads you to a place of greatness in the kingdom of God. It has its own language. If you go back in Scripture all the way back to Genesis chapter 11, you come across this iconic little story of the Tower of Babel. Now, in the story of the Tower of Babel, there was only one language on the planet and everybody spoke it. And the whole people got together and they thought, you know what, we're going to glory in our own greatness. Do you ever hang out, hang out with people who glory in their own greatness? Isn't it unreal to hang out with someone who just continually glories in their own greatness? Like you might want to go, yeah, that's really good for the first three minutes. But once it gets to four minutes and 4.30, five minutes, you might be starting to... Oh, is there anything else to talk about other than your own greatness? Is that, what, is that how it works? Can you imagine hanging out with a whole community of people that all they want to talk about is themselves and their own greatness? And you have the Tower of Babel and the community that is there. And they decide to build a tower in their own greatness. And, and it comes along and, and, the God's, and the Bible says that God brought a confusion upon them. And I think if you're hanging out with people that are just talking about their own greatness all the time, there will be a confusion there. And the Bible says they scattered. They had one language, but then they scattered because they had many languages, because they're all talking different languages of their own greatness. Their faith language was in themselves. Their faith language is in what they could do, not what God could do. Their faith language was about them and not him. And it all went to water. All went to water. In this passage of scripture, the Bible says this, the testimony of faith is what previous generations were commended for. 
The testimony of faith is what previous generations were commended for. And so the testimony is their story, how faith had actually worked. Uh, the testimony of their faith is what previous generations, so in the Bible it's talking about people from the Bible. Now in the 21st century, we can even look back on the last 2,000 years and see plenty of testimonies of faith and you can see how God commended them. There are people in this room, you are in this room, and in faith God is commending you because of your story, because of your testimony. And the Bible here in Hebrews chapter 11 gives us some understanding of what it looks like to have a testimony that is in faith. And it starts with Cain and Abel. Now Cain was Adam and Eve's firstborn son and Abel was the secondborn son. And the secondborn son in Abel was a farmer. And if you go all the way back again to the book of Genesis, you'll see this story play out. Each year or each time the season came around for the harvest, uh, they would come and bring an offering to God. Now there was no Moses at this point, so there was no Mount Sinai moment to say they had to do this. They did this because they wanted to. And I'm guessing Abel and Cain did it because mum and dad did it. Adam and Eve did it. They came to God and they offered a sacrifice, an offering, and Abel came and he came and gave the very best that what he had to offer. Now, I want you to think about this in the concept of a relationship. If you love hanging out with somebody, like, I mean, you love it, are you generous? Let's say yes, right? Yes. Let's just say yes, okay? Because I want you to be generous if you're hanging out with people that you really love, right? Because that's just a natural thing. And you're, just, you're generous with your time, you're generous if you want to buy them lunch. You're generous if you want to have coffee with them. You'll actually make time for somebody you want to have a relationship in, yeah? And, and so here's the concept with Abel. He can see that mum and dad love doing this. And he has fall, he's fallen into their pattern. And he's brought the very best. And he's brought the very best because he knows the one he is in relationship with has given him the very best. And so he's brought that not caring for himself, just wanting to be there in relationship with the one who he's right there with. This is Abel's story. And he comes and he brings, he looks through all of his harvest and he looks and finds the very, very best because he knows he's coming to a place of relationship. He's coming to a place where he wants to be and there he comes and brings it and says, Father, Father, this is what I've got and it's just so, I'm just so honoured to be here for that you have given me the very best. And this place of relationship, the Bible says, God looked upon him with favour. With righteousness. God gave to him relationship because this guy came in relationship. Does that make sense? This guy came in faith. He believed God was the creator of all things and all this stuff that he's just grown. He just knew God created. He's just looking after it. And now he's bringing it back. He's offering himself the very best and to the father who has given the very best. Then you have his older brother Cain. And Cain was looking after livestock. He was one looking after the sheep and the lambs. And I want you to listen about this relationship. So imagine there's a person that asks you to have coffee with you, you don't want to have coffee with. You start finding every excuse under the sun, don't you? I've got to clean my bathroom. I think there might be cobwebs in the garage. It's a cloud, it might rain. If you are not in relationship with a person and they ask you to have coffee with them, all of a sudden any excuse is a good enough excuse not to be there. But mum and dad have been doing this and there's this kind of expectation on him and he knows he has to do it and he has to be a part of it. And there's Cain and let's just, just imagine the conversation. He might like lamb chops, like he might like them a lot or a lamb cutlet. Does everyone like a lamb cutlet? As that sort of thing, and he's looking at his lambs, and he's going, you know what? That's a pretty good one, and that's going to taste pretty good tonight. So I'm not going to take that one. That one that might do for tomorrow night. Well, that's a little little one. There's not much meat on that. Let's just take that one. And he comes to the place of the relationship and says, "Here you go. That's what I got. That's all I got, and that's what I'm giving to you." You can hear how the relationship is not working. And there is the Father in heaven going, "Dude, I've given you everything." And you have given me the least. And the Bible says that God was not pleased with Cain's offering. Why? Because Cain did not have a language of faith that spoke out. He had a language of duty. 
or a language of expectation or responsibility. He didn't have a language of love around his faith. He just did it because he knew mum and dad was supposed to do it and there was expectation on him that he should do it. And so there it is, it's done. Going home to have lamb chops. The best ones. And you can hear how the conversation of faith is very different. Now Cain knows he didn't get God's favour. I'm not sure how Cain felt that, but he did. You know when you're out of step with God and it just feels like something's wrong, you've got a flat tyre and you just know, you can hear it. There's something wrong in the engine and you can hear it and it's just things aren't in rhythm and Cain knew it and Cain gets angry and so he decides to take his anger out on Abel and God comes to Cain even in that place where God has been pushed away by Cain and his language of faith is get away from me God there God comes and says Cain you don't want to do this and there is God opening the door for a relationship back with him and wanting the faith to start looking like something of forgiveness and something like restoration and there's Cain going no you don't understand what I feel and the long story short goes, Cain killed Abel. And the Bible then says, though, that Cain's blood cries out from the ground and his faith speaks something to us all these years later. What is Abel's faith speaking today? Don't mess with your brother. No. No. Death didn't stop Abel's faith. One of the things that I gain so much enjoyment out of believers' funerals is being able to declare that their story has not stopped. It keeps speaking. Abel's faith talks to us of an intimate relationship with the Father where Abel is able to offer himself to the Father. And death cannot steal it. Death cannot take it. Death cannot taint it. Abel's the first one in heaven that walked on the planet. That's got to be good, doesn't it? He's been there a long time. But his faith still speaks to us. And the language is wrapped around the intimacy of a relationship and the offering of himself. Let's fast forward a little bit to a guy by the name of Noah. And we know Noah. We've heard about Noah for many, many years. And the Bible says that God declared Noah righteous because of his belief. And so when Noah was quite old, God came to him and said, Noah, I've got a project for you. And Noah's like, that's cool. What is it? And he says, I want you to build a boat in the desert. Well, that makes sense. And Noah doesn't question it. He just goes, okay, what are we going to build it from? And God says, that's cool, I've got the plans for it. And he lays it out for Noah. And he says, this is the timber that you're going to use. This is what's going to happen. And then on such a time as this, Noah, I'm going to bring all the animals to this ark and you're going to get in it and I'm going to save your family. Now, that's a great message. But out there in the middle of the desert where all these animals are going to come to him, I'm not sure that actually makes a whole lot of sense. And there is Noah going, well, if that's what you want, that's what we'll do. So he builds himself an ark. Now people are mocking him and the conversation of mockery is nowhere near the conversation of faith. But the conversation of faith is this. God has told me to do it and I'm just going to do it. You can speak whatever you want over me. I'm just going to do it. You can criticize me. You can gossip. You can slander. I'm just going to do it. And there is Noah. And the day comes and the clouds come over and he's like, this is the day. All the animals start coming towards him and they come in the boat. <laughs> There is the, the bird right there, right? Tried to get in the ark. It's only a few thousand years later. Anyways, the Lord likes to keep us on our toes, right? Now, off the ceiling. And so here is Noah and he just puts the ark together, puts his family on, on it and then the Lord delivers him, right? And so the, the, the language of faith speaks of obedience to a loving Father's word. So the language of faith to Abel is the intimate relationship of giving himself or offering himself. The language of faith to Noah is to hear God 
And just, just to do what God is calling us into. And then you go fast forward a little bit further. You come to, to Abraham. And Abraham was living very comfortably in his own land. And God said to him, I want you to go and become an immigrant. I want you to be a refugee. And he goes off into the land of Canaan just because God told him to. And in that land, so this is how he, God motivated him. He said, in that land, I'm going to make you the father of many nations. And that was before he had even had a child. And so there is Abraham. He's again heard God speak. And he's been willing to be led by God because of his promise. And so the language of faith to Abraham is a language of promise. The words of promise. The words of blessing. Are you starting to hear the language of faith? It's about intimacy. It's about giving yourself. It's about offering yourself. It's about obedience and hearing God's word. It's about holding on to that promise and keep on moving. And that's Abraham. You come along to his wife, Sarah. And Sarah is a person I think we all can connect with. Because when God says ridiculous things, we kind of chuckle. Isn't that right? How's that going to happen? And we get Sarah's story. So God said to Sarah, you're going to have a child. And like she's 90 years old. And she's like, no, no, that's just not serious. You're not serious with that. And she laughs, which is why Isaac was called Isaac, one who laughs. Right. And she's, she laughs about it, but she holds on to that promise because God has given it to her. And before you know it, you have Sarah and her language of faith is wrapped around the miraculous. It's wrapped around that word impossible. And so again, when we hear the word impossible, we should be saying that's God's word because that's where he can work, right? Can you hear the language and the vocabulary of faith? It's offering yourself. It's a relationship. It's this intimacy. It's this obedience to God's word. It's holding on to his word, holding on to his promise and believing that he can do anything he wants. Now, the question this morning is, I want to say this to you. Your faith is saying something today. What's your faith saying? Subconsciously, it's probably saying something. What is your faith saying today? So it could be saying this. Just the fact that you're at church this morning could be saying, I value church. It's saying something. Isn't that right? Uh, what's Craig's faith saying when he's playing his congas up here? His joy, right? That's joy overflows from him and you can hear it. You can see it. What's faith saying when Laura plays her piano? Can you hear it? There's a rhythm in it. There, there, there's a song in it. She, she puts her heart and soul into it. Like what about when Lily plays her bass and, and leads us in worship? She searches for the words to say because she knows how valuable the words are. And, and giving the words, there it is. What about Zach when he plays his drums? You can hear it, right? Like you can hear the drums. But I wonder whether you can hear the heart. And when we finish this morning, I wonder when you're listening to Zach playing his drums, and I don't want to put him up on a pedestal or anything like that. He's my son and I love him, right? But it speaks. What about Giselle when she sings? Or what about Jared when he plays? What about Pete when he does the data projection over there, right? He honours us by his presence and by his ability. What about Naomi right here with the camera? She's honouring a worldwide web right now. Putting the very things that occur inside of this room out into a platform for many. What about Michael who's doing the sound? What about Graham who welcomed you again into church this morning? There is just something that's been spoken through your heart of faith. And I just want to give you some simple examples to say here's where it starts. Here's where it starts. For those of you guys who are sitting on the edge of your seat and you're listening for a word, there's something of your faith that's been spoken. For those of you guys who got your ears open this morning because you want God to speak something that transforms your soul, there is something of your faith speaking in that place. I'm wondering today, what is the voice, what is the language of faith that you are using and are you wrapping these kinds of words around it? Because it's saying something. It is saying something. In Acts chapter 1 verse 8, the, the Bible speaks this of Jesus when he sends his disciples out. He calls them to be his witnesses in Jerusalem and Judea, Samaria, to the ends of the earth. And he calls them to tell people the things that they have seen and the things that they have heard. So the language of faith is wrapped around the things that you have seen and the things 
that you have heard? Is your vocabulary growing right now? A few months ago, we had, had a guy coming and did a, a um, high school project here in the church, and he came and sat in our service. And he came, comes to me afterwards, and, and he comes and says, uh, he thanked me for allowing him into the service and all that sort of stuff. He's just a 17-year-old boy. And he says, this is fun. Like, he doesn't have the language of, of faith, but I love the word fun. And I think fun is a great way and a great expression. You might think it cheapens the encounter with God, but I just don't. I just think there's just so much of God to be had and there's so much that he has which is just fun. And, and when a 17-year-old guy who's never been into our church before comes out and says that he's had fun to be at church today, something of the language of faith inside of this room has shown to him and spoken to him and he has received that he's enjoyed the time of being in God's house, right? That's the language of faith. They are witness to the things that you have seen and heard. So that's Jesus talking. And Jesus is giving to us the building blocks of this language of faith, the things that, we, that they have seen, the things that they have heard, and it's the same for us. And in reading the Bible, again, it's the things that we have seen, the things that we have heard, the things that we see in our day-to-day -day lives, the way that we see the Word come alive. And then all of a sudden, we start adding this vocabulary about the things that God has done. The Apostle Paul would come along in 1 Corinthians chapter 13, and he would say, here are the building blocks for this language of faith. He speaks of hope, and he speaks of love. And he says, these three things will always endure. Faith, hope, and love. In Christ they are found. And all of a sudden, the language of faith starts growing. In Christ we have hope. In Christ we have faith. In Christ we have love. And when we have these kind of words that are wrapping around this concept of faith, before you know it, we have a language that is forming and we have a language that is growing. You know when you come across a person whose their native language is not English? I have a, a mum that comes along to playgroup. She's Italian. She hardly speaks a word of English. And the first few weeks that she was there, I, I had probably five different coffee orders from her because she did not remember the word cappuccino or espresso or she didn't know what it was in our language. And so here are we having this discussion. I've got a cup this size, no, this size, no, milk, no, no, that milk, no, sugar, yep, yeah, no, mm, yeah. And all of a sudden I give her a coffee. It's not what she wants because we're not speaking the same language. So the next week she comes along and she's trying to write it down and this and that and this. And I call over another Italian lady. I say, can you please just ask her what does she want? Because I want to give her what she wants, right? And then they have this Italian conversation in front of me. She turns around and she says, cappuccino with two. <laughs> it helps when you're talking the same language, right? When you come across someone who English is not their native language and you want to have a relationship with them, you've actually got to learn some part of the language. What would it be as believers if our native language was faith? Just faith. If that's the way we talked. In who we are, what we believe in, how it guides and leads our life. This intimate relationship, this obedient to hearing God's word and just, just being a part of that. This concept of holding on to his word and his promise and believing that God just can do anything he wants. What would it look like if we just had faith as our native language? Well, let me say, if faith is your native language and someone wants to hang out with you, they start speaking faith. There's a little evangelism tool right there for you. If faith is your native language and people want to hang out with you, and people do when you just show just a great expression of love towards them in the name of Jesus, people actually like hanging out with you when you want to love them. That's what I found. Not to preach at them, not to shove the Bible down their throat, or do anything like that, but just to love them. People actually want to hang out with you. And before you know it, they start speaking like you do. They pick up your language.
the language that we speak in faith is a powerful language. For we believe they're not just words, is that right? We believe they are life-changing words. And so if you want to learn a language that is life-changing, understand when other people come and sit with you, they will be learning life-changing words. And as they start learning life-changing words, they will see life-changing deeds. And they will see life-changing things occur inside of their own world and inside of their own life. And before you know it, that language starts being infectious because it actually builds people up. If you want to hang out with someone who's just putting you down and mocking you, you're going to, your worlds are going to shrink because if they're going to become your words, then that's going to become your life. But if you want to hang out with someone who's all about a relationship with the, with the Father in heaven that just looks like it's an intimate relationship that's just offering themselves, then all of a sudden you've got a language that people are going to be starting to understand and it's going to be translated and people are going to see it and people are going to want it. Now, when I explained Cain and when I explained Abel at the start, who wants a relationship like Cain had with God? Nobody, right? Because it's all duty. You're forced to. But who wants a relationship like Abel had? Yeah, Garen does. Who wants a relationship like Abel had with the Father? Yeah. Make faith your native language. And that will ensure when the people hang out with you, they'll start speaking the same language as you. The language of faith includes things like this. Things that you've seen and heard. Promises that are yet to be realised. You will be listening to God's voice. You'll be like Abel who understood a relationship. You'll be like Noah who understood God's voice. You'll be like uh, Abraham who, who will take God's word and God's promise and start following that word. You'll be like Sarah who can believe God for the impossible. You'll be like Rahab. Now if you go further through the book of, of, of Hebrews chapter 11, you'll see Rahab and she saw God to be her deliverance. You see someone like Samson and he saw God to be his strength. You see someone like David and he saw God to be his blessing and his redemption. You see someone like Samuel and he he saw God to be his purpose. You see someone like Moses and he saw God in the perseverance and the, and the success of following after the Father. You see someone like Enoch and he discovers heaven inside of that place of faith. And before you know it, you have a greater language and vocabulary of faith. This is the language that has been around since God created humans. And this is the same language that is here today. This language of faith. The Bible would very clearly say faith is the ability to believe in what you cannot yet see. But I want to say this. There is faith in this room. And we can hear it. And we can see it. And it should spur us on for greater things in the kingdom. When he is our focus. For he is here. I want to pray. Father, this morning I pray for the building blocks of our, our language of faith to grow. It reminds me when I was a kid, I read things like Golden Books and Dr. Zeus. And such simple words, meaning such simple things. And then as I've grown older, you learn bigger words and newer words and, and greater words and all kinds of things. And your vocabulary starts forming around the circumstances of your life and, and who you hang out with. But Lord, it is you that we want to hang out with. It is you that we want to be in relationship with. It is you, Father, that we desire to hear from. It is you, Father, we desire to speak to. And so, Father, in this place of faith this morning... May faith increase like Christ spoke it out in the parable of the seed that is sown that will become the greatest tree in the, in the garden and that birds of the air will come and find shelter in that tree. It's such a brilliant parable. But Father, may this church be a church of faith where people come and find shelter, they find deliverance, they find relationship, they find promise, they find blessing, they find strength, they find perseverance, they find heaven inside of this place. And so, Father, may we be a church that spreads our arms wide and allows the vocabulary of faith to be spoken, to be heard, and to be seen. I pray that in Jesus' name. Amen.
Well, come on downstairs and have a cup of coffee. Greet the person beside you with a word of faith and invite them to come down. A word of faith to say God loves you. A word of faith to say will you have a coffee with me. A word of faith that just invites. Let your words be a language of faith today.